It's my great pleasure to personally welcome you all to this lecture and conversation on a most timely and important topic, actually set of intersecting topics entitled Pandemic Lawyering, the Intersection Between Racial Justice and Immigrant Rights. Our speaker today, Ivan Espinosa Madrigal, is the latest and surely one of the greatest senior fellows to join us at the Rappaport Center as part of a new program that we created in 2020. Uh, the idea was to enhance Rappaport Center programming, which as I hope you all know, focuses on important issues of law and public policy, offers a wonderful fellowship program over the summer, hosts many conferences and symposia, and invites a distinguished professor to BC for a semester, a cohort that has recently included Richard Cordray, the first director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and Ohio's former attorney general. Uh, it's included former governors Jane Swift, Daniel Malloy and Martin O'Malley and former SJC justices Robert Cordy and Geraldine Hines and former US attorney Carmen Ortiz. The essential idea behind the senior fellows program was to seek uh, and invite a diverse cohort of exciting, successful mid-career professionals, including academics, practitioners, and activists who work on cutting edge issues of law and public policy. We invite them to come to Boston College for a very intense but brief visit in which we learn from them and they get to know us, especially our students with whom we hope they will work and develop future professional relationships and possibly research projects. So, uh, Ivan Espinoza Madrigal has served since 2015 as the executive director of Lawyers for Civil Rights, uh, an organization founded in, I believe, 1968 at the height of the civil rights movement, partly due to some earlier encouragement from President John F. Kennedy. Uh, I should note that our colleague, Professor Judy Tracy, served with great distinction and success as a prior executive director. And Professor Mark Broden served with similar distinction and success as a staff attorney from, I believe, 1974 to 1980. No comment on who might not yet have been born then. Um, and he was representing plaintiffs in cases of employment discrimination, housing discrimination, sexual harassment, and police misconduct. Under Yvonne's recent outstanding leadership, LCR has been a major hub for litigation and advocacy for racial justice. He has filed and won many life-changing and law-changing cases on a wide range of civil and human rights issues. He has led a congressional delegation to observe and document the humanitarian crisis unfolding in Central America, including issues of violence, poverty, and displacement that are inextricably intertwined with climate change. The National LGBT Bar Association has recognized Yvonne as one of the best LGBT lawyers under 40, and the Boston Business Journal has included him in its top 40 under 40 list in 2018. He received the Boston Bar Association's Beacon Award and the University of Pennsylvania's Martin Luther King Award in social justice. He serves on the board of the New England Foundation for the Arts and Eastern Bank. Prior to working for Lawyers for Civil Rights, Yvonne was legal director at the Center for HIV Law and Policy in New York. He was a staff attorney at Lambda Legal in New York. He was a staff attorney at the Mexican American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, known to those of us in the business as MALDEF, in San Antonio, Texas. And he was an associate at Fried Frank Harris Shriver and Jacobson. He's a graduate with honors of uh, the NYU School of Law, where he was a Root Tilden Kern Public Interest Scholar and of the University of Pennsylvania, from which he graduated summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa. Yvonne Clerk for Judge Eric Clay of the U.S. Court of Appeals in the Sixth Circuit and Judge Ronald Ellis in the U.S. District Court in the Southern District of New York. He has been extremely generous already and will be available to meet with students and other members of our community uh, and he's already also been an excellent participant in prior Rappaport Center programs. So we feel like this, this is not the beginning of a beautiful friendship, but the continuation of a, of a wonderful relationship. And so with no further ado, it's my great uh, pleasure to yield the Zoom floor to him with only one last point, which is both legal and um, functional. Uh, and that is um, that this program is being recorded. Everybody needs to know that. 
And please, uh, if you have questions, and Yvonne's gonna speak for about 25 minutes, I think, so we should have some time for Q&A. Please use the Q&A function to do that. So let's uh, welcome Yvonne uh, virtually. I wish we could all do this in person, but thank you so much for joining us. And I will now turn it over to you. Thank you very much uh, for that terrific um, uh, welcome and introduction. It really is a pleasure to be here. Um, I wanna thank the Rappaport Center for Law and Public Policy and Boston College Law School for inviting me to join you guys on campus this week. I am very much looking forward to continuing to meet the faculty and students. And I want to give a special thanks to the Rappaport Center's incredible team. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Lissy. Thank you, Cindy. Um, I wanna start by talking a little bit about my own personal background and then uh, moving into the areas of work that uh, Lawyers for Civil Rights has been championing during the pandemic and the lessons that we can extrapolate from our work for changes in what I will call the way that we traditionally have done our work and that we need to uh, really implement uh, to shake off the status quo and ultimately to uh, dismantle all vestiges of racism, um, xenophobia, and discrimination that I believe are inherent um, in traditional ways of thinking about lawyering and legal practice. Um, my journey here was not easy. I have lived in the United States since I was nine years old. My mom, my brother, and I lived in a low-income immigrant community. As a single mother, my mom worked long hours cleaning houses. Her hard work put food on the table, but we couldn't afford many things. I didn't have health insurance until my first job after college. My family didn't have health insurance until an insurance exchange opened in response to Obamacare. My undocumented family members remain uninsured. They also live under the constant threat of immigration enforcement and deportation. I didn't share a classroom with a white student until seventh grade. For many years, I attended what were essentially segregated public schools serving students of color. Many of my friends dropped out of school and eventually came into contact with the criminal justice system. And this was my introduction to the school to prison and to the school to prison to deportation pipelines. These are just a few examples of life at the intersection of race, immigration, and poverty. And when I came out in college, I added sexual orientation to this mix. Today, I am the Executive Director of Lawyers for Civil Rights, a Boston-based organization that was founded at the request of President Kennedy at the height of the civil rights movement in 1968 to move the struggle for civil rights from the streets to the courtroom. At the very beginning, of the pandemic, lawyers for civil rights and our allies filed a lawsuit to secure the humanitarian release of civil immigration detainees from the Bristol County House of Corrections in Massachusetts. This work is part and parcel of what we do at Lawyers for Civil Rights, where we provide free legal support for people of color and immigrants. And as recent harrowing images from the border have reminded us, uh, with instances of what I'll call, uh, and others have called, horseback policing, reminiscing of hunting down Black people, uh, specifically focusing on Haitian refugees. Uh, it is really important to think about the overlap between racial discrimination and xenophobia and the way that the experience of immigrants it really dovetails and intersects with the lived experience of people of color in the United States, historically and in the present. Our work in the Bristol County House of Corrections was a direct response to alarming reports at the very beginning of the pandemic that detainees were being held with no water, no soap, no sanitizer, no disinfectant no toilet paper, no masks, and no social distancing. At the time, lawyers were starting to file individual habeas petitions to secure the release of specially vulnerable individuals, including the elderly, 
and those with underlying medical conditions that were recognized by the CDC as COVID risk factors. Uh, it is heroic work to bring these individual habeas petitions. But I have to be honest, I wasn't a fan. I wasn't a fan of this individual approach. It seemed to me that lawyers were essentially picking and choosing who lives or dies, who gets released from overcrowded and life-threatening detention conditions in prison, and who gets to stay there with COVID. As lawyers for civil rights, we refuse to leave anyone behind. So instead of filing individual habeas petitions, we broke ground filing the Savino case, the first coronavirus class action of its kind in the country. Some observers in the legal community thought we were foolish. Too risky, some said. They thought it was going to be an uphill battle to get a judge to move on impact litigation issues that are systemic and structural in nature. They didn't want to risk losing. These reactions reminded me that there are many ways for us to approach the law. You can approach the law from a low-hanging fruit perspective, help those who are the easiest to help, and do it in the way that is least controversial, ruffles the least feathers. That's certainly one approach. But through our Savino class action, we secured the en masse release of detainees from Bristol County. In our class action, people were released regardless of age or underlying medical conditions because they all faced the same risk, the same life-threatening risk of COVID. A facility with a capacity of over 200 people was reduced to seven people through the course of the litigation. Seven people. Word spread quickly and copycat cases were filed across the country expressly seeking Savino-like relief. Ultimately, our class action, coupled with sustained community advocacy, helped to prompt the Biden-Harris administration to shut down the Bristol County facility. It was closed just a few months ago, marking one of the few times in recent memory that a major immigration facility was successfully shut down through a combined and strategic legal community and political process applying pressure to achieve this incredible result. Today, no one is held at Bristol County because we shut it down. There is no doubt that without the precedent set in Savino, we would have seen many more deaths across the country, especially in detention facilities. Our success in Savino shows that you cannot be afraid of breaking away from the mold. Just because everyone else is filing individual cases doesn't mean that you have to do the same thing. You cannot be afraid of taking bold action, even against all odds, even against entrenched interests. If the fear of losing or making bad precedent is holding you back, then you won't have an opportunity to win and make good precedent. We have to approach the law, not through that low hanging fruit lens, but through the lens of survival. Traditional individual habeas petitions are perfectly fine, but our collective rights, and our collective dignity can't wait for picture-perfect clients to walk in the door. Our collective equality and equity can't wait for perfect fact patterns. As lawyers and as a legal community, we have to evolve and adapt. At a time when we see so many impressive and successful examples of businesses pivoting all around us, it is really time for our profession to pivot too. And I'm not just talking logistically, I am talking substantively. To be sure, 
legal proceedings, hearings, and depositions have been taking place virtually via Zoom and other platforms during the pandemic. But I would argue that that's the legal equivalent of a restaurant offering takeout for the very first time. That's not innovation. It's more of the same, just not in person. In the current landscape, businesses have shifted substantively, lawyers for civil rights, where we also provide free legal support to small businesses. We have seen excellent examples from making candles to producing hand sanitizer, from designing t-shirts to producing masks, and the list goes on and on. And it involves much more than just offering services online. But even if we stay in the logistical space for a moment, we've seen the emergence of new service delivery models in the business world that we haven't meaningfully replicated in the legal community. And as a legal community, we are fundamentally stubborn. We appear to be married to the status quo, just like the default was to file those individual habeas petitions. It's almost as if we are afraid that we will offend someone, anyone, if we do things in a different way, if we think out of the box. But guess what? Raising novel claims, filing cases in new venues, joining forces with grassroots community groups, none of it is universe ending. But sticking to tradition would have stifled creativity and limited the universe of judicial remedies, especially at a critical time during the pandemic. The Savino case is a good example of the impact litigation work that lawyers for civil rights champions. But we have been extremely nimble and flexible, especially during the last 18 months of the pandemic. We don't typically help people apply for unemployment benefits or for emergency rental assistance benefits. But the pandemic has brought those issues to our door, to the forefront. And so we have rapidly mobilized to provide support to struggling families so that they can apply for unemployment benefits, so that they can secure emergency rental assistance to avoid eviction, so that they can stay in place with their families and children. We did this work, not because we've historically worked on unemployment or emergency rental assistance, but we did it because the need was out there in the community. And because we, as lawyers, have the resources, capacity, and expertise to deploy ourselves in this way. We didn't turn these people back. We didn't say we don't have the bandwidth or capacity. We didn't say that's not what we typically do. And frankly, I wish more legal organizations would have stepped up. But in many instances, it was lawyers for civil rights answering that call even in areas that we traditionally do not work in. And I want to spend a moment focusing particularly on vaccine equity. In response to alarming reports that communities of color needed access to vaccines and outside of the major distribution centers, we stepped up to help organize community-based vaccination clinics. We joined forces with the Whittier Street Health Center to coordinate mobile COVID-19 vaccination units that were dedicated to housing projects, to churches and community centers in neighborhoods like Roxbury, Mattapan, and East Boston. In collaboration with grassroots groups, we also started running our own multilingual and multicultural vaccination clinics in East Boston. Together with our allies, we have vaccinated more than 5,000 people focusing specifically on low-income zip codes, targeting people of color and immigrants, especially at a time when so much vaccine misinformation and hesitancy exists out in our communities. I often get asked, 
why are lawyers involved in vaccination clinics? The answer is extremely simple because we have to use our privilege and voice for good. We're involved because the pandemic is calling on all of us to step up in ways that are non-traditional. And this means that we must all revisit how we operate and interact. And this is deeply connected to dismantling all vestiges of racism and discrimination. We have to avoid the tendency and pressure to stay in our lane. Traditional structures and definitions of what our clients have to look like and what our legal practice has to feel like is all intertwined with systems that didn't work for many people even before the pandemic and has maintained structural inequities that most certainly came to the surface during the pandemic. This means being open to changing the way that we do things. This also means stepping outside of our comfort zone. It is critical for us to change the status quo, to change the way that we see ourselves as lawyering and to change the way that our legal organizations function in the ecosystem. This alone would have a tremendous impact on accelerating more fair and equitable outcomes for our clients and for our communities. I will close by making two specific suggestions and recommendations to the folks who are listening. And one is that it is critical for all of us to continue to join forces to fight for equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. And I mean this broadly, including those scenes that have been so impactful and alarming from the border, especially in the rounding up of Haitian migrants. It is critically important for us to do this now more than ever as we continue to assess the lingering impacts of the pandemic. In many ways, a pandemic that has become endemic, it is critical for us to be firmly and unequivocally committed to dismantling all vestiges of racism and discrimination. And it is critical for us to not just be passive bystanders. We need to stay involved. We need to be able to not just use our voice to stand for justice and to express concerns about racial justice, but it is critical for all of us to get engaged and to weigh in on matters that you care about. We all have to be actively anti-racist to dismantle structural racism, and it takes work to be woke. This is work that each of us have to do to save ourselves and each other, to empower ourselves and each other, and to build bridges across differences. And that leads me to my second point, we have to dedicate the time to forge alliances and partnerships, to build relationships that will build those bridges across communities. It is critically important for all of us to see a connection between our respective movements, our respective work and our respective communities to be able to really forge collective solutions at a time when we have to revisit how we do business in light of the pandemic. With that, I am happy to answer questions as part of the Q&A function of the chat. Um, I see that Professor Kenstrom is already encouraging that. 
And uh, I want to thank Professor Kenstrom and the Rappaport Center for inviting me here today. I look forward to having this conversation with you. So it's not just a lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think people are applauding all over the place, but um, I don't. I don't know that we can communicate that uh, directly. Um, I, um, I I really was struck by a couple of things that you were saying, and I, I wonder if I could um, ask you one question to, to start things off, and then we have a couple in the in the Q and A. I, I wonder if you could talk a bit more about the vision of of intersection that is motivating. Uh, this work. I have the feeling that you were speaking in many ways to a particular um, counter narrative that sees, as you, as you put it, separate lanes or separate forms of engagement. And um, I know in, in the field of immigrant rights work, which of course I've devoted much of my life to as well, one often gets asked some really hard questions like, you know, do you support open borders? Uh, I ask my students to consider the question of um, is the nation state itself, is the very idea of a border or a discrimination or a differentiation between citizens and non-citizens, is that in itself a violation of equal protection or you know, how, how far can we go with this, um, with this analysis? And I, I wonder if that's not too abstract, I'm, I'm just personally quite interested in knowing what your thoughts are about that because as I'm sure you know, at a certain point, the, the, this agenda does encounter opposition sometimes from labor unions, from civil rights groups, from other marginalized constituencies and communities that sometimes um, feel that you know, migrant labor can be exploited, for example, you know, to undercut union gains. So I wonder if I could just tease that out of you a little bit more, and then we'll turn to some of the other questions that we have. Yeah, the, the, I, I deeply believe in the concept of intersectionality, and I think it is um, accurate, not just from, from a legal perspective in terms of how our clients experience intersecting uh, degrees of discrimination and oppression. For example, if we have a client um, who, is, who is a Black woman who's being discriminated in the workplace, um, it's not just because she's a woman. It's not just because uh, we're talking about a black person. It is really the intersection of of gender, the intersection of gender and race that are at the heart of that particular experience. And I'm using that just by way of by of, by way of example. Many of us navigate many roles in our day to day life. For example, in my case, uh, I am a husband, brother, son, and yet. When it comes to our clients and the way that we tend to think about our clients, we tend to silo them. We try to just pigeonhole them into one particular category, into one particular type of legal relief. And, and I think that that is extraordinarily damaging, not just for the way that the law should evolve to, to, to really address issues of intersectional identity, but it also is out of step with the way that people identify. Because as we've seen with the most recent census, uh, the number of people who identify as being uh, more than one race, more than one across multiple identities is, is exponentially increasing. And, and that is something that's not going away. It's going to increase as time goes on. Um, and so the, this idea of intersection, I think is critical. And it's not just critical as an issue of identity, it's, it's critical as an issue of, of how the law needs to respond to the needs of the community that is, that is increasingly identifying in that intersectional way. And I think that for far too long, we have divorced these things. We tend to think of uh, racial discrimination as separate from what happens at the border, right? And we see the images of people under a bridge in Del Rio, Texas, images of horseback policing and we tend to think of them as existing in the immigration arena and being disconnected from, from the lived experience of Black people in America. And, and the bottom line is that the two overlap and coexist. And the way that Black Americans are treated, whether it's in the workplace or in society at large, or whether we're talking about something like George Floyd, is deeply intertwined with the lives and experiences of the people who are under that bridge 
and Del Rio and who are being um, essentially hunted down by, by horseback. And so I don't see these things as separate. I see them as interconnected from both the impact on the ground and the way that the law should be thinking about it. And I think you're, you're, you're right, Professor. The, ultimately, what we tend to think about, especially um, through more traditional lenses in, in, as lawyers, is that we should be staying in our lane, that we should be making the case as simple as possible so that the, we, we keep the jury's attention, so that we make it uh, digestible uh, for the jury, for the judge. But people understand these complexities. And I think it is critical for us to push the envelope, to make sure that we are actually presenting whole people, whole stories, whole narratives, complex claims and, and arguments that, that go beyond just pigeonholing our clients into one thing. And that, and that really create that, um, that strand that connects the experiences at the border with the experiences of Black people historically and our exclusion of Haitians over the years. This is nothing new. They were excluded in the 80s for, for a host of issues, including a perception that they um, uh, were disproportionately affected by, by HIV and AIDS. I mean, these are things that have historical muscle memory that are, that are now uh, coming back to haunt us. And so, so I definitely think of this intersectional piece as critical here and just as critical to address it is to be able to think complexly comp uh, in a complex way about identity and not to stay in our lane the more that people want to push us there. Um, and and I, I'll say you know, this concept of open borders, you know, I don't think we need to solve that right now. I think that's an issue that we can talk about and debate and that would be wonderful to talk about. But I think right now what we're talking about are people who are fleeing, not migrating, and we as a country have a responsibility, a humanitarian responsibility to be able to address the needs of these people. Just like we have a responsibility to Afghan people who have left in Afghanistan would be persecuted based on the fact that they uh, are a woman involved in human rights, that they translated for, for American officials, right? They will be persecuted, high likelihood of persecution for these people. We're not talking about open borders. We're talking about protecting discrete groups of people who are fleeing, who we have a humanitarian responsibility for, not just in the Afghan example, but also in the example at the border. We're talking about people who are fleeing a country that has essentially imploded, uh, a country that has been in this process of implosion for a long time and that was actually discriminated against under uh, the Trump administration at the federal level, uh, precisely based on their identity and perceived need. And so I don't, I don't think we need to go into open borders doctrine. I think just focusing and zeroing in on uh, refugees, humanitarian protections provides an answer to some of the more immediate things that we're seeing in the world, whether that's in Afghanistan or at the border right now with the Haitian community. Professor, did you have a follow up? Sorry, yeah, I was muted, but uh, no, I was just going to say, I said thank you. And then I, I was going to say that, uh, as I'm sure you know, um, the, complex, the, the legal complexity here is daunting because the Supreme Court held in the late 19th century that actually the Constitution doesn't really apply at the border. So many people in the field would say if we could at least get to the point where we were applying some recognizable version of the rule of law at the border, some kind of legal restraint on the discretionary power of government and maybe, maybe some version of constitutional protections, that in itself would be a major step forward. And we don't have to grapple with the harder question, as you say, of whether the nation state is completely to be transcended, but just applying the law would be a good first step. And I'm sure that's what you're trying to do. I, I completely agree, Professor. And I think, uh... I think the important thing here is that even though the feds deserve discretion, that discretion is not absolute. The federal government can't just say, I'm not going to let in Black people into the country. That's discrimination. The Constitution forbids it, and the Constitution applies to the federal government. 
And if the federal government cannot do that as a matter of any type of policymaking, then it can't do that in the universe of immigration. And so I, I think this is one of those examples of it's not about the Constitution applying necessarily at the border to, to these people that, that weren't uh, thought about at, at the time of the framing of the Constitution. It's about oversight and accountability for federal conduct and federal mm -hmm. actions. And that has always been subject to the Constitution, including important provisions of equal protection, the 14th Amendment, and all of that jazz. And so when you ask me, what's, what's the legal basis here? What we need to make sure is that the federal government is not discriminating on the basis of race against people who are showing up at the border. Because creating that scheme of you're from a, from a North European country and we're going to let you in, you're from Haiti and we're not going to let you in, that creates a discriminatory impact that I would say is, is unconstitutional and well beyond the scope of federal discretion on how immigration gets implemented and enforced and, and how immigration functions. Um, so I think we could still provide broad latitude and discretion to the feds, but that discretion ends where discrimination starts and where the constitution applies. And so I think, I think those are important things to keep in mind as we talk about what are the rights of the Haitian people at the border. And as we talk about what are the obligations of the federal government, um, you know, we've seen, especially during the Trump years, a lot of discrimination, a lot of anti-blackness uh, really at the root of, of the way the federal government was talking about African countries. Um, references to people uh, living in huts and that, and that that's why they wanted to come here. Uh, references to, uh, you know, profanity laden references uh, to countries like Haiti and Central American countries. And so what we see is, is uh, like I said, this anti-blackness that, that at its root um, is well, most certainly unconstitutional and an inappropriate basis for policymaking. And so I, I, would, I would agree with you completely that, that there are competing uh, interests here, of course, and that the feds need to have a lot of leeway but, but I would say that is cabined by the constitution. And most certainly, I think all of us in this Zoom and all of us out in our communities have an interest in making sure that we fight that tendency towards anti-blackness that, that we're seeing in our television screens today and that for far too long characterized the way that we think about immigrants, especially those from Haiti. Yeah, as I'm sure you know, you know, Guantanamo Bay was used as a processing station for Haitian refugees who were interdicted in the in the first Bush administration. So there's certainly a long history here. Um, let's open it up to some questions. We have a few, I'll just take them in the order that they came because they're all sort of different and um, uh, I can't really organize them any better than that. So the first one comes from Sarah Bonfanti who asks um, a, a very practical question. Uh, how can interested potential lawyers and she puts in parentheses current law students, uh, but for future knowledge, <laughs> get involved with uh, lawyers for civil rights. And on a related, more e specific question, uh, do you have any internships? <laughs> so maybe you can do a little sales pitch for your organization here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so yes, we do have internships. We take interns during the academic year, fall, winter semester, fall, spring semester. And then we also take them during the summer. Um, we, we do 10 week internships um, and uh, uh, you know, we are a small organization, extremely busy. You know, we do not have the capacity to create you know, intern assignments. We, we don't have the capacity to just give you busy work. If you weren't there, it would be a lawyer doing that work. And so since day one, the interns at our office are doing work that a lawyer would be doing, which is which is really terrific. Um, it's it's wonderful exposure, um, and so uh, highly recommend uh, that you check out our website, lawyersforcivilrights.org, and uh, and if you are interested in volunteering uh, or interested in some type of internship, just send us your resume and we could take it from there um, with an expression of interest and, uh, um, and definitely wonderful ways of getting involved. 
you know, we've been talking a lot about immigration, discrimination, racial justice this morning, this afternoon. But ultimately, um, at the organization, I, as I alluded to, we also support small businesses. We do uh, work around fair housing, voting, climate change. Um, we, we have a broad charge um, in terms of civil rights. And so uh, take a look at what we're doing and see if there's something specific that may, um, uh, that may pique your interest. I will say the website has a quite interesting historical focus too. I mean, it, you really, it traces a lot of the litigation going back many, many years to get a sense of the trajectory of the organization. So students can feel like they're a part of something. Well, as we said, it's been in existence for more than 50 years now. It's um, important my... to document uh, for posterity what we have struggled. You know, litigation is not just about getting specific outcomes. It's also in and of itself a record of, of what we're doing. And so it's, it's important uh, to document those lived experiences and what's happening. So um, my colleague, Judy McMorrow, who perhaps you know, uh, thanks you for a wonderful and inspiring talk, as do we all. And then she asks, and I'll just quote it, uh, one of the great moral challenges is getting overwhelmed by the need. You can't do everything, but must resist giving uh, sometimes. So how did LCCR triage to bypass some structural or creative anti-racist challenges to focus on others that you felt you'd have a maximum um, impact. This is, um, I think, a really important question and something that I was wondering about too, because obviously, once you get out of your lane, suddenly there's a lot of lanes and you know, how do you make those decisions? A very fair question. And um, I think the, there are a couple of, of different ways to think about this. One is um, at Lawyers for Civil Rights, we don't think of ourselves as, you know, just sitting around in a room trying to come up with the work that needs to be done. You know, we, we, we don't do that. Um, we take our cues from the community. And so if the community is coming to us saying, this is what we need, that's the priority. And so um, it's, it's not about us uh, imposing our interests and, and, and our priorities in the world. It's quite the other way around. If a community group like um, the Chelsea Collaborative, La Collaborativa, or Centro Presente, or Haitian Americans United, uh, the NAACP. These are all our clients. We have a long um, uh, established relationship with these players. If they're coming to us saying, this is the issue we need you to work on, that's the issue we work on. And so our model is extremely community driven. We see ourselves as community lawyers, um, and the priorities are set by those community groups that are uh, in the trenches, they're in the grassroots, they're the ones who are telling us what's most relevant now. And so I might think, you know, what people need right now um, is a Zoom account, and we need to make sure everybody has a free Zoom account. Um, but that's what maybe I think personally, but then in coming into contact with uh, the Chelsea Collaborative, La Collaborativa, I, I realized that there are people that already use uh, different formats uh, and uh, uh, outlets. For example, WhatsApp, which is widely used in many immigrant communities to communicate for free uh, with their native country, people in their native country, and to do file transfers. You could send documents, photos, upload, download through WhatsApp. And so why am I going to go after Zoom and give Zoom to everyone when people don't need Zoom. They have WhatsApp, they feel comfortable with WhatsApp and it's already free. And so I think that's a good example. It's a hypothetical example. It's a good one in terms of how we can easily um, as lawyers come to the table thinking that we know what's best when in reality, um, nobody wanted Zoom. They already had WhatsApp. And so um, I think it's important for us to be in sync with those community groups because that helps with the triage. Right? That is the triage. The triage is how many folks are coming to you reporting that and wanting that. And so when people are coming to your office saying, you know, we are going to have a major eviction crisis unless 
we're helping people get connected to emergency rental assistance, that's your marching order. And so for us, the triage, you know, not that it's easy, but the triage is uh, an inherent part of how we structure our community partnerships and relationships. They give us our marching orders. So that's that's a little bit of insight into how we think about um, the, the law and the community and the triage system. And, and we don't do everything, right? There are things that are best handled by another organization. Maybe um, some immigration proceedings are best handled by the PEAR project uh, or by Greater Boston Legal Services. And so we most certainly uh, cross-refer so that those instances can find the right home. And so I think it is, uh, it is more of an art than a science, uh, but the triage has to be done thinking about deployment of existing legal organizations, deployment of pro bono attorneys and law firms, uh, in addition to the needs of community groups on the ground who, who may have pressing issues that need to be tackled first before you go down the road to other things. And so that's a little bit of how we, a little bit about how the sausage gets made at Lawyers for Civil Rights. Great, thank you. <clears throat> um, Yvonne, let me take you back to an earlier moment. Um, I just saw it was not in the Q&A, but in the chat. Tom Palmer had asked the question of how do you define the term open borders? And I should say that I think I was the first one to use it, but I'm assuming he's asking how you define it because it's your talk. So even though you said that we, uh, this is not necessarily something that we're ready to engage with on a litigation level or anything, just briefly as a definitional matter, what, what, do, you, what do we mean when we say open borders? I actually don't personally believe in open borders. I think that, um, uh, I think that for a host of reasons, there, there should be a process. Um, do I agree with the way that we currently do it? Absolutely not. I think the system is broken. I think we need to have a, a much more nuanced way of, uh, of ensuring family unity uh, and doing it within a very reasonable time frame, uh, instead of having some people wait for years to be reunited with siblings, for example. Um, and I think we need to have a much more efficient way of, of having employment-based visas as well, and employment-based visas not just at the professional level uh, to get scientists and other uh, highly sought-after people, but also um, to get people who can come in and do uh, other work that, that needs to be done. Right now, uh, all of us uh, have been in restaurants, stores, and other areas where help wanted, and, and there is help wanted signs are everywhere, and, and we just don't have the workforce. There is no, it makes no sense for us to have vacancies when there are people at the border who are willing to do these jobs. And so I don't know if I believe in open borders necessarily, um, uh, but I think that we should dramatically change the way that we think about immigration to create opportunities for people to come here, um, whether it's for family or professional purposes, so that it can support uh, the communities that we live in and our economy. And so I do think about this much more as being a lot more efficient than what it currently is, and as being a lot broader than what it currently is. But, but I wouldn't say that I, and, and I'm not sure how I would define open borders because that's not necessarily a concept that I personally espouse to. Um, and I've also personally said this is not necessarily LCR, Lawyers for Civil Rights position right. on this, but I've always said comprehensive immigration reform um, doesn't necessarily have to look like an amnesty. Would I like an amnesty? Sure, that would be wonderful. But if we are, uh, if we have some things there that, um, uh, that we want people to do in order to be able to qualify, then we should be able to do that. Um, uh, and so uh, I, I'm not sure, Tom, if that answers your question, but I, I try to come at this from a little bit more pragmatic of, of a position, um, uh, especially these days. Um, um, no, I think that's an excellent answer. And I'm pretty sure it's an excellent answer because it happens to be my opinion as well, more or less. So that, to me, that's the mark of an excellent answer. <laughs> Um, let me turn to Chelsea Eddy, uh, one of our students, who this is in line with the previous question from uh, Professor McMorrow. Chelsea writes, my understanding is that access to affordable legal services 
is a limited resource, which is clearly true. And Chelsea is curious how you as a lawyer and an organization decide and evaluate whether the best use of your time and expertise is to provide traditional legal services, by which I assume she means case-by-case -case representation, and or to provide social services that may have less of a legal component, but are still incredibly helpful to the populations that you serve, such as assisting with vaccinations. Do you coordinate with social service organizations or health groups? How much of that community involvement does take place? Not before the pandemic, we didn't. Um, mm -hmm. But we started doing it because of the pandemic. And um, uh, it was important for a couple of reasons. One is um, we were not going to get vaccines into low-income communities unless lawyers got involved, unless we raised the legal arguments for why um, there was an obligation on the government to provide those vaccines. And, and very frankly, um, also the threat of litigation. Um, without that, uh, we would have been uh, stuck with the mass vaccination centers, um, at least for the foreseeable future, without a direct intervention at the community level. It took sustained legal advocacy to get those community vaccination efforts up the ground. Um, it's, it's terrible to say, but it's the truth. Um, that's, that's the way it happened earlier this year. And so it, it took the threat of litigation to, to change the way that vaccination efforts were being handled. Uh, so that's one important reason for lawyer involvement. And then once we got involved and started, started working on the, on, on the community interventions, we realized that many of the pro bono attorneys that we have, we have over 40 law firms that are affiliated with lawyers or civil rights for purposes of taking on pro bono cases, whether it's incorporating a small business or suing a police department for, for, um, uh, for some type of George Floyd incident. And so uh, they do a wide range of different work. Um, and we have hundreds of lawyers through those law firms, many of them with time to be able to dedicate to, to helping to run the clinics. And so we were in a very privileged position to be able to you know, not necessarily dedicate our attorney time, but to dedicate the time of other attorneys, paralegals, and volunteers from the community who are non-lawyers who wanted to help out with vaccination clinics. So I, I think you're completely right about making sure that we are you know, protecting attorney time, uh, being good stewards of the resources that we have, making sure that we get the biggest bang for our buck and that we're helping the most people uh, with the legal expertise that we bring to the table. Um, but at the same time, we could also be very good stewards of our pro bono network and volunteers and steer them in ways that helped with a lot of the social services that are inherent in the question that was posed in the Q&A. And so the, the answer is we were able to do both. We were able to uh, focus our work on litigation like the Savino case and to bring that and do it well, uh, among other uh, high profile cases that we have been doing over the last 18 months, but we were also able to coordinate direct service uh, provision of, um, uh, of support for people applying for unemployment, for people applying for rental assistance and coordinate volunteers for vaccination clinics. Um, when do we sleep? We get very little sleep, but, but, the, uh, but the point about the coordination of resources is an important one and one where we've been able to harness the broader community to, to bring all of this um, uh, to bear and to fruition. And I think it's been a really important part of our work at Lawyers for Civil Rights. Like I could not live in a world where Lawyers for Civil Rights would have said, we can't touch that, or we can't get involved with that, or that's not our bread and butter. That's not what we typically do. We should just stick to the legal lane because then we wouldn't have gotten 5,000 people vaccinated. Those are 5,000 people who otherwise may have never been vaccinated. And they did it because we were able to get involved in that process. And so we've seen tremendous results. And so for, for me, it's been a huge lesson that we need to think holistically about the way that we're providing services. Maybe the answer is not that we're constantly doing this work, um, but we can think strategically about how some of this uh, 
non-traditional work complements the legal work and stabilizes our client communities, uh, which is important. Um, what good is it that I could go to court if my client's priority is a vaccine and they don't have one? Um, once the vaccine is done, then I could really start working with my client in making sure that the legal issues can get addressed as well. And so the stability that some of these services has brought to our client communities is, is priceless. And so it's been a tremendously good use of our time. Great. Um, so we have just about a minute or two left. And let me just wrap up. We have two more questions. I'll just put them together because they're both sort of technically legal. Uh, the first is from my colleague, uh, Professor Mary Holper, who runs our immigration clinic and is serving as our associate dean for experiential education. Um, she thanks you for a great presentation and um, reminds us about the importance of impact litigation. She's wondering, what is your take on a solution when you have great success like shutting down Bristol and then clients get moved to far away ice jails in red states, which this has been an old problem in Louisiana and other places. So how are you handling the movement of people away? And Christopher Sanacor asks, could you speak about some of the emerging issues involving immigrant youth and how lawyers can support transnational students to receive social services and education supports that they need? He works for the Providence Public School District is currently in a DOJ agreement for failing to provide multilingual learners the proper programs they need by law. Um, unfortunately, we only have a minute or two, so maybe just give us the headlines and then we can follow up offline, possibly, hopefully, with those questions. Absolutely. And thank you, Justice Hines, for joining us. Um, oh, yeah. Um, that, that is, that, that's just wonderful. What an honor to have you here and, and, and to have the rest of this distinguished audience. Um, so quickly, um, we sued in Savino for civil immigration detention, right? So this is not criminal detention. This is not someone who's been adjudicated a threat to the community. This is not someone who has to be confined. This is someone who is uh, waiting for an asylum hearing or some other type of removal proceedings. And, and then they get, um, uh, they get confined. So the confinement is at the government's discretion. So we sued to release people who the government was choosing to keep confined during a pandemic, even though there was absolutely zero requirement for them to be confined. And so the issue, as I see it, is not so much about moving them away from their families or away from their communities or into red states, however we want to frame it, um, uh, I think the issue really is about how the government is interfacing with these immigrant communities and how the government should not be using civil immigration confinement for people who do not pose a criminal threat or any type of threat to the community. And so um, I, I think the question is, is really about putting pressure on the government to fine tune its practices surrounding immigration and nothing could be more, uh, more illustrative than what we're seeing at the border right now. And then for, uh, for Christopher, uh, I completely agree that, that we need to focus more on, and I would say not just immigrant youth, but youth in general. The pandemic has been extraordinarily hard on youth um, um, by some accounts from some of the educator uh, folks that I talked to, education advocates. Uh, youth are behind at least two years academically not to mention the social development, the social and emotional development. Um, I'm talking to school officials who are describing um, uh, kids in elementary school who long ago uh, let go of a blankie or a teddy bear who are bringing those things to school and they're in you know, fifth grade and they're bringing those things to school because of the social and emotional issues related to the pandemic. And and, and so we, we have a lot of issues here, not just the immigration issues when it comes to youth. And so I, I think it is critical for us to be thinking about how we provide services that are um, more culturally relevant, um, more uh, linguistically accessible, and that are more holistic in that, you know, that, that immigrant youth or, or any youth is going to need uh, guidance, counseling, and, and other support to be able to, uh, to work through the issues presented by the pandemic. And so, um, you know, on top of, uh, you know, greater investment in English language learner programs, on top of 
greater investments in literacy so that we can teach all kids um, to read and succeed, right? All, all of these interventions are needed across the board. And so I wouldn't necessarily uh, place uh, immigrant youth in a different category. Uh, I think we need to be cognizant of all of that. And I would say that's a high priority for us as an emerging issue. Uh, it's already here, it's not emerging. Uh, that we need to tackle is how we support um, education um, and, and close opportunity gaps in light of the pandemic. And you're going to see a lot more work coming from us specifically on this arena. So this is an excellent uh, point of closure. Great. Well, thank you so much, Yvonne. This has been truly wonderful, inspiring and provocative in the best sense of the word. And uh, just uh, I really admire the work that you're doing and the energy that you bring to it. And we're just very happy to have you as a senior fellow. And um, this is a wonderful kickoff. I hope people will be in touch with you. I know you're coming to my class and uh, I know you have some other opportunities to meet with our students. So uh, on behalf of us all, just thank you so very, very much. And we look forward to seeing you again during the week. It is my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you to the amazing audience.